Ciao. Ciao, ciao Luca. Come va? Bene, bene, bene. Brava, parlerò di Brucchi esattamente di quello. Eh, immaginavo, infatti, eh, Brava. per rimanere in tema, mi stavo rimettendo a posto i capelli un attimo. Giusto, Quindi giusto. No, ti, faccio subito, ti faccio subito... Co-host, così sì. faccio una prova veloce e vedo se... Ecco qua. Fatto. Ok. Allora, fammi vedere se questo posso fare share. Lo vedi questo? Perfetto, sì. Perfetto, ok. Ecco, pensavo di usare un attimo prima... Adesso la, la nostra PowerPoint è solamente di presentazione, faccio due slide di presentazione della Dante e, e di sì, te sì, poi. Sì, alla grande. Va bene? Va bene? Sì, 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 non c'è nessun problema. Cioè, era, era solo per provare. Se mi... Poi anche la sua seguo te. E come sfondo. <ride> eh, vabbè, adesso bisogna dissimulare che sono le nove e mezza e finiremo tardi qua. Grazie, eh, grazie per la tua disponibilità. No, 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 non c'è problema, anzi mi fa molto piacere pensare di essere sulla West Coast. <ride> sì, immagino. Quindi ti lascio magari, che hai, se vuoi ancora, vuoi avere un tuo quarto d'ora di tempo, o come preferisci, e sì, chiudiamo, sono, oppure, sono pace, rimango... visto che c'è già anche gente che sta già entrando, per... magari possiamo già... Allora, mi muto. Già magari a salutarli. Allora faccio un attimo lo share screen anche della, della nostra PowerPoint. Uh, hello to everyone, for those who are already there. <laughs> Good evening. Abbiamo, ci sono 185 persone registrate, però wow. poi non so sai quanti poi dopo alla fine no, no, arrivano. Adesso ehm, vediamo, faccio questo advanced. Vediamo se funziona con questo sistema. Ecco, sì. Fantastico, così... Riesci anche tu. La tecnologia, hai visto? PowerPoint. Cosa fa? Splendido. <ride> Come hai fatto a entrare nel PowerPoint? Così? Eh, C'è una... Non so se dipende... La, la nostra università, magari immagino anche la tua. C'è una cosa oh. che si chiama Advanced. Quando fai Share Screen, c'è un'opzione che uh -huh. tu puoi fare che è Advanced. E se fai questa opzione Advanced nello Share Screen, eh, puoi, eh, si chiama... Beta, slide Entra. as virtual background, okay. si chiama beta. Perfetto, adesso vado a cercare. Non posso farlo perché c'hai tu il coso, ma lo, lo faccio in un altro momento. Molto cool. Sì. E, quindi io mi fermo, cioè faccio due punti, mm -hmm. mi fermo, eh, moderi tu le domande e poi faccio il terzo e il quarto che un po' vanno oltre Leonardo e... sì. Sì. Cioè, seguo te sì. senti come funziona con questo tuo Italia Innovators immagino che tu ormai abbia tante richieste di, di, per fare eventi talk online è una bella idea che hai sì. avuto sì sì no, adesso Faccio una serie, cioè se vuoi posso anche dirlo se, se interessa, faccio una serie per il, il consolato, l'ho fatto nel 2020, una serie di eventi per il consolato di Filadelfia, ma nel 2021 è proprio una serie, si chiamerà la Italy in Philly Lectures, um, e sono Italy? legati Italy in Philly, Philadelphia, Italy ah, in ecco. Philly ah, Italy Lectures, uh -huh. uh, e sono, sono disponibili al pubblico generale e possono, ad esempio la prima sarà il 10 febbraio sulle biciclette magari posso dire qualcosa eh, sì. si possono trovare sì, alla fine, sul mio sì, sito su... uh -huh. sì, sì, sì. Eh, se, se, se alle persone è sicuramente un'occasione un di continuare la conversazione per uh -huh. cui 
E come si sta a Filadelfia? Sì, adesso sto facendo... <ride> bene, bene, bene. Noi, vabbè, io in realtà ho vissuto anche in Canada. Eh, mm-hmm. Abbiamo vissuto a Montreal. Eh, ho vissuto... È da 15 anni che sono in, in Nord America, come dicono i canadesi. Sì. Eh, ho vissuto a South Bend, a Boston, a Montreal e siamo qua da Filadelfia da 7-8 anni. Mm-hmm. No, ci troviamo bene, è bello. È, è una grande città ma abitiamo a 15 minuti da Filadelfia, eh, per cui un po'... Siete un po' nei suburbs, quindi. Ah, e, e, e la sì, Villano... sì, sì. E Villanova University dove rimane, quindi? È a 15 miglia a ovest di Philadelphia, mm-hmm. è, cioè suburbs, è quella che si chiama Main Line, che è la, insomma, la zona più, più, più ricca della città, per cui di, di tutta la zona urbana di Philadelphia. È molto bella, è molto bella. Poi è comodo anche cioè, essere sulla East Coast, anche per volare in Italia quando certo, si potrà. Certo, assolutamente, assolutamente. È molto più veloce, più rapido rispetto a dove siamo noi. Sì, assolutamente. E ho visto che hai fatto anche un'intervista a Jeffrey Schnapp, eh, molto carina. Sì, lui è il mio, è il mio mentor, lui. E faccio... Sono su, sul, sui suoi passi. Eh, sì. Abbiamo fatto anche una conferenza a dicembre che pubblicherò su Italian Innovators eh, che si intitolava Flair era su Made in Italy con uh, lui sul design e, e Eugenia Paolici su la moda per cui in the meantime I just write something in the chat just to buonasera James buonasera good evening James and Good evening. Everyone. And perhaps I have to rename myself something here. Yeah, it's already. It's okay like this. I just check if there is anyone who has problems. Ci sono anche altre piattaforme adesso, tipo Crowdcast, per fare eventi. Non so se ne hai sentito parlare. Sembrano molto più... Ah. Come, come si chiama? Crowdcast. E noi abbiamo, Crowdcast. Ab- abbiamo provato già a utilizzarla. È veramente molto più flessibile, poi consente anche molte più opzioni per, per esempio per farsi per promuovere anche altri eventi futuri nelle pagine iniziali mm-hmm. di presentazione dell'evento eh, è veramente carina infatti stiamo pensando di, mm. di trasmigrare no grazie questo è, è, è anche io sto cercando piattaforme più user friendly eh, zoom funziona per le lezioni così ma per questo genere di eventi non sempre è un po' troppo così rigido. Sì. Mm-hmm. Oh, we have someone from the Philippines. Hello, Abigail. 
And we are have hello. Hello. <laughs> we'll be having people from the Silicon Valley, nice. from Toronto, from yes, from Italy. So it will awesome. Hi, Ariana. Hello, hello, Jill. It's how Jill. Are you? How are you? Nice to see Very you. Very well, thanks. <laughs> Nice to have you here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So we have many members of the Dante Society, but we also have a lot of new comers. So it's very good, very exciting to have you now to see these events uh, more ever more popular. And uh, so with many people joining in and uh, it's a great way to keep us ourselves all connected despite these times of COVID-19. We also have with us uh, Stefano Gulmanelli, who is the, the president of our society, of Edante Society. I'll also check my other mail to see if there is anyone who is... Sometimes there are people who have problems connecting. That's... So it's little by little. Oh, hello, Shariar. We have engineers, we have architects, we have um, professors from the University of British Columbia, my colleagues. Hey. Um, we, Hi, Hello, hello. Good to see you. Nice to see you, thanks. As, and as I was saying, we have people from um, different parts of the world, from the Philippines, from the Silicon Valley, from Toronto. It's nice to see all, uh, all, all you here tonight. Oh, I forgot it. Let me see if uh, it works. Um, I can do it here. Thanks. Can you hear the music? Yes. <laughs> yes, clearly. Hello, Silvana. Hey, Ariana. Sarah. Hello, Zoran. How are you? Good, good. How are you?
I, I know, Luca, that this is Baroque music and we are a little bit earlier. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Hello, Rosanna. We wait another couple of minutes so that everyone will be joining us. We have many people joining us tonight, so we have a, a full event. just stop this oh, oh okay sorry <laughs> no. I don't know how to stop this <laughs> okay <laughs> done <laughs> Okay, I think we, I know that many people will still be joining us, but we, I think it's uh, 6.30 and we can, 6.31 actually, and we can start already our event. My name is Arianna Danino and I am the culture events organizer of the Dante Alighieri Society of BC. 
So on behalf of our society, I welcome you all tonight for this talk by Dr. Luca Cottini on Leonardo and the Italian idea of technique. Just a few words about our society. We are a non-profit organization for the promotion of Italian language and culture. We offer um, Italian language courses at all levels from beginner to advanced through uh, our school, the Dante Italian Language School in Vancouver. And we uh, are just opening up two new courses uh, starting on February 3rd, one on conversation for those of you who already know a little bit of Italian and want to, um, to improve their mm -hmm. Italian language skills. And also we have Italian for Travelers uh, starting on February 15th for all those, all those of you who don't know any, any Italian and are ready to travel again once uh, COVID-19 is uh, definitely uh, conquered to a certain extent. And uh, I would also like to um, tell you that we really welcome um, donations or we encourage you to become a member because it's thanks to your donations and to your memberships that we can keep on providing this kind of cultural events. And now uh, without much further ado, let me introduce to you Dr. Uh, Luca Cottini. Sorry. So Dr. Luca Cottini is Associate Professor of Italian Studies at Villanova University in uh, the United States. And he's the creator of the YouTube show, Italian Innovators. Both a literary scholar and a cultural historian, his research focuses on Italian literature and industrial culture of the 19th century and 20th century. His two books examine the works of Italo Calvino and the birth of industrial design in Italy. So let me join uh, you in welcoming Luca Cottini, Dr. Luca Cottini tonight for his talk. I will end my presentation, my PowerPoint here and uh, allow him to share the screen with you. Here in the background, you have... Brunelleschi's Dome in Florence. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and I'll uh, share my screen in the meantime. Uh, hopefully you can uh, see it. Um, okay, uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is really a pleasure to be uh, here uh, with you tonight um, from the East Coast uh, uh, Milano is near Philadelphia to Canada. And um, I want to share with you tonight uh, some reflections on arts and technology uh, that are part of my research uh, with regard to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution uh, in, in Italy, industrialization and 19th century, but like starting back from its cultural mindset, from its model, which I trace in Leonardo's mix of arts and technology, and which I try to date back to the Ulyssian uh, mindset. And uh, some of the reflections tonight are uh, related to my scholarly work and my work as a, uh, a professor uh, with, with students, undergraduates, and um, so is based upon my YouTube show, uh, Italian Innovators. And uh, I'll mention some of the episodes, uh, some of the mm, protagonists of my talk are uh, people that are really fascinated by and uh, to whom I dedicated episode of, of the show. Now, um, we live in a hyper-technological world. And uh, we associate technology, the word technology, uh, kind of as our primary go-to option to solve our problems. And, and I have this mantra in mind, like, if only we had more technology, uh, which is really an underlying mantra behind much of our public conversation, uh, even though sometimes it might be used as a magical tool to push agendas or pragmatic justification, opening new markets in education, medicine, engineering, the growing of the internet of things. To Anglo-Saxon years, it seemed astonishing, but actually one of the most common heard mantras is exactly the opposite. If only we had more culture, 
which equally identifies culture as the balm or the to political and individual restlessness. Now, in general terms, this apparent dichotomy is more pronounced and perhaps find, finds its grounds uh, in the different emphasis that the North American and Italian school systems place, the one on the value of STEM in developing a problem-solving attitude, so the primacy of technology, and the other primacy of the humanities as a coil to develop a static understanding of our place in a much larger history. So the cultural approach and Italy is one of the few countries where actually Greek, Latin and philosophy are taught in high school. Now, I started with this anecdotal considerations as a way to highlight the terms of our conversation, uh, which are not at odds, but rather occupy the same space. So in placing the words of technology and culture in dialogue, I want to reflect on their necessary relationship and on their common need to create things that operate well and with meaning. And in this context, we'll examine the Italian approach to technique as a synthetic expression of a cultural and operative mindset. And we'll see how the Italian human-centered notion of technology in construction, engineering, or manufacture can outline an alternative model of technological growth or perhaps a different understanding of our cultural uh, and current challenges. Now, before digging into our team, I wanted to start with the word technology, as you see from the slide, which we often use uh, without a clear definition. So what is it? And what do we mean when we use this word? Now, at a surface level of inquiry, following a very generalist approach, technology is an extension of ourselves or a set of tools empowering our human capacities. So, and touch screens are extensions of our fingers, granting them precision in handling and tangibility to the abstract, the abstractness of, of the web. Microscopes and telescopes empower our eyes to see beyond the limit of the too small or the too big. Microphones broaden the capacity of our voices. Bicycles strengthen our leg power, granting us to conquer space more rapidly. And arm or leg prosthesis, which were introduced after World War I for, for the wounded soldiers, replace missing tissues. So in the same way for the feet the and accelerator pedals in, in car unite our body with the propelling energy of the engine telephones, gramophones, and radio extend our physicality, as we are seeing now with Zoom, onto an, an ubiquitous or simultaneous space. Uh, we are in the same place, even though we inhabit different geographies in, in this current uh, meeting, Zoom meeting. And in this general sense, then, the word technology does not solely apply to what we label normally as tech but also more broad, broadly to the human desire and capacity to multiply our relationship with reality, to make it more effective, and I would add, more meaningful. So forks certainly makes, make us more civilized and our engineering systems in communication, so internet or in transportation, think of like tunnels or canals, make us more connected. Now, beyond this surface level, however, technology implies a particular kind of intelligence of reality. And this is really the object of tonight's presentation. And we'll see this in connection with the two Greek components of the word, techne and logos. Now, logos means two things in Greek, reason and word. It indicates rationality. And the Greeks identified with a philosophical idea of the sensibleness of reality, but it also indicates a reasonableness that can be argued and communicated through words. Techne instead means art in Greek. And it's art of doing what we call the how-to intelligence, the tutorial intelligence, and also the art of creating meaning. So the craft to paint something beautiful, to write a moving piece. In, in a sense, this is the arts uh, as we mean in our modern sense. Now, what is curious then, the, the Greek language doesn't have a word for technology, the word technologia, 
uh, actually the word technologia is a rare word used to indicate the art of arguing systematically. But if we were to find a Greek equivalent for the operating intelligence uh, that we call technology, we have to look instead at the word metis. Allow me a little digression here. I'm a classical philologist, <laughs> so I'll, uh, but this is an interesting story which relates to the famous story of book nine, Odyssey. Uh, the book where Ulysses, uh, the Greek hero Ulysses manages to escape the cave of the one-eyed giant Polyphemus. Now, after piercing his eye with an incandescent beam, you might recall the cleverness of his answer to the giant's question, who did this? And his reply, no one, is really a play on words with the similar sounds, uh, and this is the scene of Ulysses breaking into his eyes, the similar sounds Odysseus and the word Utis, which in Greek means no one. Now, as the Cyclops screams that no one blinded him without getting any help, of course, from his fellow giants, Odysseus introduces an ironic variable to his first reply using the other Greek word for no, uh, the negative me. So not is said both u and me. And in this sense, the word utis that he used before becomes the word metis, no one again. But now the word metis very much sounds like the word metis that we defined earlier. So the, the word that means creative intelligence keenness in finding solutions. Now, in these episodes, really, what I want to highlight is that Metis coincides with the operative intelligence of Ulysses, which finds expression both as a technical strategy to find a way out of the cave, and also as rhetorical cleverness or art. So engineering that becomes storytelling, and uh, a strange mix of really planning and myth-making uh, that, that we say the translation for metis in Latin is the word ingenium, operating mind. And the word ingenium is actually the word behind the two words in English, engineer and ingenuity. So the technical element is inseparable from its value. The operating gesture is inseparable from its creative push. And the technical ex execution of a solution is inseparable from its cultural planning. In the same way, and we'll see that how this unfolds uh, in Italian culture, technology is a strategizing and storytelling intelligence, overlapping engineering, ingenuity, and aesthetics. This is really the key of the Italian approach. So we'll talk about technology not just as the set of tools extending our grasp of reality, but above all, as this operating mindset that we saw in Ulysses, as this vital energy driving our thirst for meaningful interactions, objects, or relationships. And this of making things with meaning in the material and the intellectual world is really key to understanding Italy's success, not only in the fine arts, but also in design, in construction, engineering, and man in the manufacture of objects. Now, this human-centered understanding of technology, or as Italians call it, technique, owes much to the Renaissance in its acute synthesis of classical heritage and Christian mindset. But it owes a lot to the archetypical figure of Leonardo da Vinci, whose ingenium perfectly matches the Ulyssian fusion of ingenuity and, in and engineering that we talked about. Now, starting from Leonardo's visual notes in the Atlantic Codex, which is the collection of his drawings and sketches, which is conserved today in the Ambrosiana uh, Library in, in Milan, and I think their intellectual over the centuries up to the present, we'll talk tonight about four elements that define Italy's peculiar relationship to technique, starting from Leonardo. Technique as a craft of doing things and endowing things with meaning. So we'll consider technique as a visual knowledge, as a form of storytelling in the first part, then we'll have a break for, for some questions. And then we'll a technique as a relationship and as a collective art of doing. Now, first of all, in the work of Leonardo as both a painter and an engineer, 
technology is related to design. The Italian word disegno indicates both drawing, so the sketching of an idea, as you see now, and designing, where design is really the planning of its meanings. The word disegno in Italian also indicates the concomitant effort to imagine elegant solutions, design, and endow them with meaning, painting, really. So Leonardo's visual thinking, relating drawing to both technical and aesthetic experimentation, reveals his metis or his ingenium, which does not elicit innovation from abstract theoretical postulates, but rather from constant testing, what we call the art or the craft of things, and also from aesthetic imagination. So to say briefly, the engineer for Leonardo is a painter. And as we see, for example, in his rendering the erections of city walls or in his drawings of a crane, uh, a crane that he saw um, in Brunelleschi's um, Cantiere, like uh, the working area for the Duomo in Florence that is in the background of Ariana's uh, Zoom call. Um, and Leonardo um, saw this machinery that was developed by Brunelleschi when he was the apprentice for Verrocchio. Uh, Verrocchio is the uh, architect that designed the ball that is on top of the dome. Uh, now, the design of engineering solutions, as you see, is intimately related to drawing and is also related to the drawing of space. As we see, for example, in the 20 year project that Leonardo ran of the navigation canals, the so called Navigli of Milan, which he completed for Ludovico Sforza. He was actually hired by the Lord of the City, Ludovico Sforza, to complete this project of nav navigation canals uh, across the city. It was sort of like a, an idea of creating Milan as a little Venice. Uh, and in this project, like he. Um, this is the map of the city of Milan with kind of the drawing of space, but also with the drawing of the dams that were holding and leveling the different um, kind of waters coming from different areas of the city at different heights. And one of these dams, the Conca dell'Incoronata, uh, that you see in a picture, is uh, still visible in the San Marco district of, of Milan. So the engineer as we saw, is a painter, but also the opposite is true. The painter is an engineer. Now, in, in the Last Supper, which I'm sure you saw at some point, or in the vault, and this is like, a, uh, you might not have seen this, in the vault of the Sala delle Asse, the room of the wooden board, in the Sforza castle, the, the main castle in the, in, the, in the center of the city of Milan, um, Leonardo experimented a new form of chemical reaction, so the so-called dry fresco technique, as a way to reach uh, brighter colors. And uh, we know now that this technique really worked only in the short run because the, the colors actually faded. Now, in the same frescoes, uh, Leonardo also constructed drawing, however, as an architectural space. So the space of a refectory, where the Last Supper is, is uh, placed in, near Santa Maria delle Grazie. So in the prolongation of the light from the window of, of the building to the fresco, or in the perspective breaking and ideally continuation uh, continuing of the wall. And we see how he constructs the architectural space also in the castle room through the thematic animation this is the, the Sala delle Asse, the room of the wooden boards, uh, that he made it uh, through a sophisticated network of uh, roots, plants, and trees. Now, Leonardo is the archetype of this Italian tendency to turn engineering to aesthetic drawing. So we saw this in the Navigli of turning painting into architecture of space, as we saw in the Last Supper, and materials like woods or cranes into imaginative tools, as we saw from the Crane of Brunelleschi or the Sala delle Asse. But I want to show you some example of this uh, how, how this is prolonged over time, over centuries, and some example of this transformation of engineering into expressive designs of space. Now, here is the 17th century city of Palmanova in Friuli, northeast uh, Italy, which was conceived as a prison. 
uh, a Venetian prison and was designed as a, and the 18th century kind of replica by Luigi Van Vitelli. Luigi Vitelli was the author of the, 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 the Royal Palace in, Cal in Caserta uh, in, in the Southern Kingdom, uh, but also of the violin shaped gardens of the Royal Palace of Caserta. And here is like the five star fortress of Ancona that is known as Mole Van Vitelliana. And we also see the design of space, for example, in the 19th century Casa Scacca Barozzi in Turin, uh, which was designed by Alessandro Antonelli. Uh, Antonelli is the author of the famous Mole Antonelliana, it's kind of the iconic monument of Turin, uh, which is, and this Casa Scacca Barozzi is actually shaped like a slice of polenta. It's famous for that. Now, this idea of painting as an architectural device is also visible in uh, Giulio Romano's uh, Palazzo Te in Mantua, which was the uh, residence for the um, kind of the time off of the Gonzaga, uh, Gonzaga family, uh, which were the lords of the city of Mantua in Lombardy. And we see this uh, painting as architectural device, for example, in the Sala dei Cavalli, in the uh, horses room featuring uh, the favorite horses of the Duke of Gonzaga, Gonzaga, or in the Sala dei Giganti, the giant's room, which features in a sort of a, an IMAX theater, the fall of the giants under Zeus thunders, uh, represent, and Zeus is represented with the face of Charles V, the emperor. And uh, the room really represents the tumbling of the walls to scare any opponents of the emperor whom the Duke of Mantua backed, okay? Now, in terms of... Uh, imaginative rendering of, of materials as we saw uh, earlier with the crane of the walls. Leonardo's sketches of mechanisms or support structures uh, in the Atlantic Codex uh, produce two consequences. First of turning drawing into an active hypothesis. So a, a maker. As in the case of the aerial screw that you see, uh, will later become uh, the principle for the development of the helicopter uh, in 1930, which was designed by the Italian engineer Corradino Dascanio. And we'll talk again about him uh, in a few seconds. And the second effect of these drawings of mechanisms is that of turning construction tools or machinery into elements of a larger cultural space. And we see this approach, for example, uh, the work of the Italian steel company Cimolai. Uh, in Cimolai, I dedicated an episode of Italian Innovators to Cimolai, is the top producer of steel, uh, quality steel. And um, it's so qualitative that actually um, the United States actually uh, prefers to import uh, Cimolai steel uh, rather than producing it here. And I see uh, this, for example, in the case of the vessel, uh, which is in New York City in the new development of uh, Hudson development. Um, the vessel was actually built with Chimolai steel. This that you see is the uh, railway station, uh, the high-speed train station of Reggio Emilia, uh, where you see that, um, uh, like in the cases of bridges and stadiums, uh, you might recall, the stadium of the Beijing Olympics, um, the, the kind of the uh, nest. And uh, you see that steel uh, in Chimolai's work is not no longer just steel, but becomes de facto an art tool. Now, in the work, and this is the second point I want to make, in the, in the work of Leonardo as for the Ulysses with the Cyclops, the technical or strategic thinking is inherently connected to storytelling. So visual or ex experiential knowledge, the metis, inherently tends to become narration. So Ulysses that narrates the whole point about being no one just to create the myth about his, uh, the, the solution that he found to get out of the cave. And there is no technology actually without a discourse or a surrounding narration. And this is one of the keys of the technology discourse in our contemporary world. So the narration of myth of technology as the great problem solver, equalizer and producer of opportunities. So without a connection when reading or meaning, we could say technology is really reduced to mere automation or 
uh, kind of a, a debased artificial intelligence. And this is why, in my opinion, the contribution of culture is so crucial in reconfiguring our idolatry or, exclu or exclusive dependence on technology. To go back to Leonardo, what kind of storytelling does this technique that we see drawn perform or imply? And I want to get back to his work on the Milan's Canal system that we mentioned earlier. Here is one of the sketches that uh, Leonardo drew. And uh, Leonardo's technique to shift grounds and uniformize different uh, water levels throughout the city is actually a good metaphor of literature itself as a common ground where different waters, so themes, topics, or personalities, or different levels, social, moral, linguistic, mix and continually interact. At the visual level, the very pages of the Atlantic Codex reflect this common ground. So the Atlantic uh, comes from the big pages that Leonardo used that were the big pages of atlases. And these pages are really an analogical uh, space where different themes, elements, or languages like in the verbal and the visual language freely interact and where elements shift from their natural context to a different space reacting with it by way of analogy, contrast, surprise. Now, in literary terms, full narrative force is called displacement. And it's at the base of many cinematographic plots. So the character from the province who suddenly finds him or herself in New York City, uh, the unusual neighbor that opens up a previously unknown space. So this ability to shift ground and locate one element in a previously unforeseen uh, realm or in an analogic storytelling space is also behind the work of another um, great Italian scientist and humanist, uh, Galileo Galilei, uh, who was the sign of a prominent 16th century musician and uh, whose real innovation consisted not in inventing the telescope. The telescope was actually invented by the Dutch, but actually in the audacity to point the telescope no longer toward the sea uh, or the battlefield, but actually toward the moon. And the audacity of using this technical tool as an aid to once again, draw and narrate his scientific observations, first in the Siderius Nuncius of 1611. This is the book where he announces his um, discoveries of uh, the imperfections of the moon. And also later in the dialogue in Italian on the chief, uh, two chief war systems of 1632, where scientific um, kind of uh, discovery is uh, conveyed through a narration. So only through the fiction of a platonic dialogue in a way, or what he calls a mathematic caprice, those technical explorations start to make sense and be communicated. Now, with Ardo, to go back to him, I want to show you another drawing of his that is particularly uh, connected to what I'm saying, which is the three screaming heads of a horse, a lion, and a man. This drawing is particularly interesting because it reflects this ability to shift planes and allow different spheres to communicate together on a common ground, in this case, the common element of the, the scream. And... Um, this is interesting, this, this technique is not just a creative resource for storytelling, uh, but also for designing innovative solutions. It's really a technique to produce innovation. And uh, I wanna give you an example of this. Uh, we go back to Corradino d'Ascanio, and this, is the, this dynamic of, of shifting planes is uh, what moved Corradino d'Ascanio to actually design his innovative, to the design of his innovative Vespa in 1946. Now, two-wheel scooters were actually invented by Americans during World War II. Uh, they were vehicles for parachuters to move quickly around the enemy lines. And Corradino d'Ascanio, who was an engineer for the airplane company, Joe, and previously created the helicopter, actually did not invent the two-wheel scooter, but rather shifted the concept to a different plane, moving the agility and rapidity of war scooters to the realm of urban mobility and transferring the techniques for building light and sturdy airplane bodies 
and to decree an equally light and sturdy two-wheel vehicle, the Vespa. And here he is with uh, Enrico Piaggio. So analogic space and shifting planes. One additional element of Leonardo's narrating technique can be seen in this other drawing, which is a sketching of flowers. Uh, and the peculiar element of his narrating technique is the idea of animating matter or finding life uh, animation in mere matter. And as we saw in the Sala delle Asse, the vision of matter as an aesthetic tool so ingredients as really an aesthetic tool, the understanding of the feelings, moods, reverberations, effects of matter is a key ingredient of, uh, of Italy's culture of design as, as a human center applied technique endowing objects with life. Now in Italian culture, wood can become a design platform as we see in the Studiolo of Urbino's Duke Federico da Montefeltro from the 15th century, where wood becomes life. Uh, this is all made with different uh, varieties of, of woods. It's not painted. Um, and we see that glass, for example, becomes uh, in the arts of, of Murano a multifaceted tool. Uh, so a material that becomes an aesthetic narrating tool. We see iron as a poetic support, for example, in the work of the liberty artist uh, Alessandro Mazzucotelli in the early 20th century, transforming the iron into um, really a, 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 an object of art. And we also see steel, as we mentioned earlier from Cimolai, as a thing of beauty. Uh, this is the vessel uh, from 2018 in New York City. And uh, let me add this, even bricks or mortar uh, can become animated. As we saw, for example, in the news recently, it was discovered that the drying tiles of Brunelleschi's uh, dome in Florence actually crystallized the footsteps of 15th century animals that were walking on them while, the, while they were drying. So the last element um, that takes life, a life of its own, uh, is actually the ladder. And uh, letters are the ultimate animated objects as a playful of design and experimentations, for example, as we see in the backward calligraphy of Leonardo. Uh, and as we see, for example, in the development of the letter as a graphic type, uh, type was a mold, it was an object. Um, and um, we see this, for example, in the invention of Aldo Griffo, who was working for the uh, Aldo Manuzzi, the biggest publisher, a Venetian publisher of the 16th century who invented italics. And um, we also see this experimentation with the letter in the work of uh, Olivetti's, uh, in, in their 20th century research by Olivetti, top Italian typewriting company on uh, fonts. Now, um, before we uh, take a break for your questions, uh, and, and before like the third and fourth point, I wanna, um, tell you the story of uh, the beginning of the adventures of Pinocchio uh, by Carlo Collodi, uh, not the movie, the cheesy movie rendering by uh, Walt Disney, uh, but in the beginning of the book by Collodi, um, the author actually stages a particular scene where uh, two characters, Maestro Ciliegia and Geppetto, are actually debating over a piece of wood. And Maestro Ciliegia, who just bought this piece of wood and listens to a little thin voice that comes out of it, says, like, it, it's nothing. Uh, I'm going to throw it away. And Geppetto instead actually observes this piece of wood and says, actually, this voice, uh, the idea of doing something with it, and I'll make with this piece of wood uh, the puppet that can dance and fence and sing. And the difference between the two of them is really this lack of imagination on the one hand, and on the other, the ability of Geppetto, who is the archetype of the designer, as Leonardo is in a way, to see uh, storytelling, in, to see the livelihood of matter, and to see the myth-making, the storytelling that is in, entrenched and in, in, intertwined with the technical gesture of carving this piece of wood. So uh, if uh, there are any questions so far, I'll, I'll be happy to take them and uh, then continue the conversation. So I leave the, the word to you. 
Yes, I forgot to, to tell you that after half an hour, after the first part of the presentation, uh, you were welcome to ask questions either through the chat or by just uh, unmuting yourselves. So if there are any questions before you know we start with the second part of the presentation, you're welcome to, to ask them now. Uh, Someone says, fascinating, loving this, <laughs> not more. I have a question if no one else has a question. Let me see if there is. I do have a question. Great. Um, I um, Just hearing about Leonardo and all, the, all these, um, both being like engineer and, and then also a creative um, person, a famous person. Um, it makes, makes me think of the fluidity of a person does not need to be just in the hard science or be, uh, this is how I used to see it, I guess, when I was younger, is you belong to or your career or, you know, your, your future is in a hard science. Uh, I, I mean, like, you know, like the science part, like be an architect, be an engineer uh, in, in, in the more hard stuff. Uh, whereas the creativity and artist work is the other way. It's like the two side of a pendulum. But actually, um, people can be, you know, both. But it seems like um, at one point in time, when we're just looking at and we're admiring work of uh, engineers or, you know, or, or architect or, you know, people that are in building something. And that's all. That's all we look at. Whereas I think gradually now, I do appreciate that there seems to be more creativity in um, uh, even looking at buildings, looking at you know the current um, uh, constructions of uh, different things, um, be it from a flower vase to you know some home designs uh, to a building. Uh, there is the the two sides of it. So I, I don't know if. I'm making sense here, but I, I do see that seems like there's a, uh, maybe it's a, a resurgence of a person can be of many talents. Uh, it's not just one or the other. I wonder if you have any comments about that, if you, if you look at that at all. Thank you for the comment and the question. And certainly the hard science doesn't, um, stop you from being human uh, and what is interesting is that um, if you think about like I don't know but if um, people who design algorithms uh, mm. are not like people who are uh, not, that they are not uh, machines that an algorithm is actually a, quite a creative language and mathematics is quite a creative language they will yes a metaphor of mathematics as a way for students to understand what le learning a language means. Uh, you, you have to think mathematics. You have to think in Italian as a way to um, create or gain an understanding of a certain reality through a, a particular perspective that the language gives and as a way to learn how to speak it. And uh, in the Italian context, this um, you know, connection between uh, the scientific elements and culture is really prominent. And I recently dedicated an, an episode to uh, the scientist uh, Fabiola Gianotti, uh, who is a physicist, is one of the top physicists in the world, uh, director of the CERN, uh, Center for Fundamental Research in Geneva, and uh, was nominated by Time Magazine in 2012, um, one of the top five most important people in the world because she announced the uh, discovered boson Higgs, uh, the um, Higgs boson, uh, which is kind of the so-called particle of God, the, the, the mechanism that triggered uh, the kind of formation of matter at, at the beginning of, of our universe. Correct me in her, uh, apart from extraordinary uh, pedigrees, pedigree is the fact that she actually has a degree in piano. So, uh, uh, if you listen to her presentations, uh, if you go on YouTube, uh, Fabiola Gianotti, uh, she always goes back to this humanistic understanding and philosophical understanding of science uh, as just a mere execution or um, 
experimental, but really as an experimental field that aims at responding to our deepest human questions. Without that horizon, uh, it becomes uh, a little bit more shallow. So without the horizon of a pianist, science becomes a little less. Uh, so that that's kind of the, the the challenge, and to me the fact that one of the top physicists in the world is actually has a piano degree, uh, is revealing of a particular understanding and a particular model that I think uh, Italy carries. Thank you for uh, the question. So, uh, do you mind if I jump in with a question? Here? Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I'm actually an engineer myself, and I wonder if you might comment on your opinion of the focus or lack of focus of um, technical drawing or developing one's artistic hand in, in engineering school today? Well, that is, that is something that, for example, in um, Italian schools is very prominent. Um, and to me, the, 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 there, there are different design schools uh, that have a more or less, um, Kind of uh, strict relationship uh, with with the the engineering act. Um, to me, it seems like engineering can uh, go without this drawing ability. It can work by itself, but that this education to this drawing ability that comes from design uh, gives it like a depth um, to the metaphor of music that we described earlier. Uh, if you listen to someone play uh, the organ, uh, you know that the organ has uh, also the pedals. And if you add the pedals, so the bass, to, to the music, there's like a roominess, like a, a, a space to, to that music that doesn't change the melody that you hear in a way, but creates a completely different... So... Uh, in the same way, you can be an engineer without being uh, without being educated to destroying ability. Destroying ability, however, introduces an element that creates depth and creates what Italian designers would call genuineness or authenticity of, of the product, which is related to the fact that the product speaks to our deepest human. Even an engineer, so in this, an engineer has to use his ingenu or her ingenium uh, as a way to, um, it, 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 with ingenuity, <laughs> in, in a sense, with, with this creative aesthetic sense, where aesthetic doesn't mean it's not like just uh, a particular taste that you need to have, but it, it's something that gives um, the, the projects their depth. Uh, if you see the vessel, uh, why should you use steel in that particular way? Isn't it enough to kind of just use beams and uh, connect them? Uh, or, or, or think if you're, it came to my mind one one example. Like if you think of uh, if you're familiar with the brutalist architecture of the 1970s, uh, if you ever went to Buffalo. Uh, New York is um, the um, style of architecture that predicted the idea, stated that you, you had to build with cement without windows because like uh, there was like a space that could kind of rationalize the working um, kind of um, positions for, for, for the employees. So if you go there, it's really the 1970 Polish architecture in a way. Uh, so building blocks of cement without window. Uh, the work that is done in those buildings is actually the same that might be done in buildings in Vancouver or in New York City uh, that are with incredible skyscrapers with a view on Manhattan or uh, the Victoria Island. I don't know. I've never been to uh, Vancouver. The work is the same, but the breadth and the depth changes completely. Uh, the perception of, of alienation on the one hand and the perception of breathing room on the other. Uh, give the product a totally different uh, authenticity and genuineness in a way. And this is reflected in the product. There are several. I can tell when my student. What? Go ahead. 
There are several questions. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you won't be able to answer all of them now. Uh, perhaps we'll leave some of them for the uh, second part of the Q&A. But there is one in particular, perhaps I can ask you now. There is, uh, there is uh, the question is this. There is a university in the USA called Thomas Aquinas. And my understanding is that they are based on more of the Italian style of learning of philosophy and sciences go hand in hand, using original historical texts to learn from all the fields of logic, philosophy, and arithmetic. They believe that learning and innovation go hand in hand. This is quite a novel concept in the Western world. Do you see this expanding in the future to bridge the gap between cultures and human growth? Well, in a way, this relates to the uh, understanding of, of the humanities and, and the role of the humanities. This is like a, a big debate uh, that is taking place in North America in general, a little bit less in Europe, uh, but given the uh, amount of dollars that especially in the US students pay for college, um, it's felt that the human a, a degree in the humanities uh, is less useful so called, uh, or applicable than kind of degrees in STEM. Now, uh, the role of cultural philosophy in the case of Thomas Aquinas University uh, is actually um, mental in devising, designing innovation, because like, innovation is not just like the kind of random pioneering uh, quest for uh, kind of novelties, uh, but it's really the act of responding to a need, finding a solution, uh, but also the act of making that turn meaningful. Uh, there might be a lot of solutions that are given that, however, don't respond to the most interesting need, which is really to make sense of our time, to enjoy our life. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I always provoke my students and say, well, you know, if you listen to a piece of music or if you drink a, a good glass of wine, that is not necessarily useful in the sense that it doesn't produce anything. But that um, glass of wine, that experience of beauty is what allows to really uh, broaden the horizon and see the extension and the depth of uh, our actions within a much larger scheme, a much larger horizon. And again, this is visible in the actual outcome of a work. When my students um, work under a very tight schedule in very uh, tight spaces, they normally write things that are less uh, profound, less interesting, less innovative than when they are uh, exposed to a broader range of connections, uh, interconnections am among things and not kind of a compartmentalized knowledge that um, kind of severs us from the totality of things, which is what interests us and uh, what is the relationship between an object, whether a manufacturer or an architecture, and kind of the totality of our human experience. So uh, that is not useful in in the term in quantitative terms, but it's certainly life changing in qualitative terms. Uh, this is more visible now during during the pandemic, where this uh, becomes key to to find uh, in in our reality what has real value, real substance. Uh, so. This is, once again, the, the Italian model is very rooted in this idea that things need to be well executed, but also need to carry a meaning to, to make sense and enjoyable and beautiful. There is a question by Flavio. So thanks, Catherine, for your question. And there is a question by Flavio. Uh, Luca, is there any person or a few people today in 2021 who you'd feel channel the spirit of Leonardo in their contributions to work, living, or play? Well, in a way, there are, um, I mentioned um, Chimolai, in a way, for the kind of idea of the material, uh, just simple matter like Maestro Chilesa, but it's something that contains um, 
a potential, a, a storytelling potential. So it's Shimolai one. Um, certainly, uh, Corradino Dascanio also uh, is, is a key Leonardesque figure. Um, again, I, I dedicated an episode to him because I'm truly fascinated by him, uh, where I uh, compared the aerial screw with uh, his design of the helicopter. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I would point you to um, an engineer that I recently interviewed for Italian Innovators. His name is uh, Fiorenzo Omenetto. And uh, Fiorenzo Omenetto is an engineer who works at Tufts, who um, has been named one of the top 50 uh, innovators by Fortune magazine uh, recently. And uh, Omenetto worked on silk. So he found in silk a protein that has like a lot of application uh, in nanotechnology and uh, in bioengineering. Uh, so in his vision of silk, I could find again the ability of Geppetto vis-a-vis -vis Maestro Ciliegia to observe not something else, not find like the random novelty, but observe into what exists, its depth, its, its potential. So in this sense, innovation comes from innovare, which makes to make things new, not to invent new things, but to see in things like a, a, a new depth. There, there are other questions, but uh, perhaps it's better if you keep you if you now. Yeah. The part, or, or do you want to answer the questions now, or do you want, or do you prefer to keep the to keep the questions for the second part of the Q and A? Maybe, maybe we can. Uh, in, in the second part, I wanted to extend this thing, um, the discourse on Leonardo on kind of. Uh, bringing it to our present on a broader understanding of uh, kind of. Um, the... So perhaps there is a question that refers to this first part, it's uh, by Olga, referring to the diagrams of the wheels and, and what looks like gears or cogs, what is the story you believe Leonardo is telling? Well, this um, part is uh, analogical space that um, I was trying to describe, uh, where uh, Leonardo is not designing a blueprint and we'll talk about it with regard to the vitruvian man in a second uh, where the the vitruvian man and and and, and the drawing of um kind of a painting um is is related to coming a blueprint in 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 the example of the gears gears are not just like a, a blueprint but they become part of an illogical space of connections. Uh, if you remember like the um, page that I showed, uh, gears are placed within, uh, not like a blank space, but like within a space where they interact with words, interact with other elements and other decorative motives. Uh, so this is storytelling in the sense that like the, uh, the designing of a gear is placed within uh, a dynamic context. Uh, storytelling means to put something in into motion, into into a movement, uh, a narrating movement. So, um, if you think about storytelling as verbal storytelling, someone telling a story in a book, uh, that is is not exactly the point. But like, if you think about storytelling as this dynamic space of continuous question among things, uh, then those gears start to make sense within the the broader. Uh, a, a much broader horizon. If you think about the starry sky, uh, the starry sky is full of dots, um, but only when someone is able to connect those dots imaginatively into constellations, uh, the, these dots start to make sense. Uh, these dots start to speak to us. So in the same way, uh, the placing of these gears with this broader uh, horizon of connections uh, is what gives them uh, a freshness that otherwise would be uh, impossible to achieve in, in isolation. Okay, thank you, uh, Luca. I think it's better if you now start with your second part of the presentation and then I'll ask the rest of the questions at the end of, the, of your presentation. Perfect. So thanks for, for all the questions. And uh, from all the observations that we gather, really it, it appears clear that the Italian um, mindset of Italian technique is, is inherently relational and social. 
uh, and I said this also in, in, in the first set of questions, every act of ingenium is really not an isolated individual feat, but rather the expression of a human relationship and the manifestation of attention to bear fruits across time and space. So a relationship can take the form of competition or discipleship, rivalry or friendship, uh, rupture or continuity. And I want to take the, as an example, Leonardo's sketch of the Vitruvian Man, an incredibly famous uh, drawing. The drawing is a visual match to actually a, a passage from uh, a book written in the first sec century uh, by Vitruvius, a book on architecture. Vitruvius was a Roman architect who really wrote the first essay treatise on architecture. And the book was rediscovered by Poggio Bracciolini, a humanist from Florence in the 15th century. And Leon Battista Alberti, the guy who theorized the perspective, used it as a reference point for his book on architecture. Uh, uh, Alberti wrote a book on architecture. He was an architect himself. And also for his theory of, on perspective. So Leonardo too was inspired by Vitruvius, not only because they had a common passion for artillery and hydraulic systems, but also because of their common idea of the proportional and symmetric relationship that the inner space of the body, of the human body, needs to have with the space of a construction. So following the need outlined by Vitruvius for harmony in the similarships of the different parts to the whole, Leonardo's artistic and technical rendering of the, what he calls the well-shaped man, needs to be read then as both a portrait, and some say this is his self-portrait, and as the blueprint of a perfectly proportioned building. So a drawing, but also a blueprint. And the idea of the human body symmetrically circled in a circle and a perfect is also reflected in Brunelleschi's engineering feat, so the Duomo, the dome of Florence Cathedral that you see, which makes manifest both the continuity with Vitruvius in the proportions of the structure in the relation to the body and competition with the Roman model of the Pantheon, which epitomizes such balance of parts. Now, the element of competition in construction is even more pressed in subsequent renderings of the Vitruvian fusion vision from uh, Michelangelo's circular dome in, of St. Peter's Basilica to the disruptive Baroque shape of the ellipse, which reacts against the allies nature of a purely geometrical man and reveals in the deformation of the circle into an ellipse, the existence of an inner energy, what Nietzsche would later call the Dionysian in, oppos in opposition to the calm, the calm realm of the Apollinian. And here are two uh, Roman elliptical from the Baroque age, 17th century of uh, Bernini's Andrea al Quirinale or Borromini's uh, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane. Now, as we see in the line from Vitruvius to Leonardo, or from the Renaissance to the Baroque break, or even in the 17th century rivalry of Borromini and Bernini, engineering a vault, or a ceiling, or a dome, is not just a technical thing, but really a contest across time and space, the, the way in which we establish a connection across geographies, time and space. This rivalry in mastering different techniques of construction to express different ideas of men or personalities is really at the heart of the 17th of the 16th century, the old calls into courts. And at the origin of the contest that you see between several Italian cities, there is like a, an incredible court in Urbino, in Mantua, in Ferrara, in Pavia. And these courts were really ways to express through engineering, through buildings, the inimitable genius of their dukes. And they the cultural tension to really outlast the present and become history, therefore kind of becoming relationship across time. So we talked about technique as a relationship and I wanna add here a dimension of uh, this experiential know-how, which is the Italian structure of the workshops, where the individual ingenium 
is formed and brought to perfection in the relationship with a master. Uh, what we saw with Ver between Verrocchio and Leonardo uh, was his pupil. The Botte system workshops uh, was really a training school communicating knowledge by doing. It was artists, painters, sculptors, but also for artisans of every kind. And during the 15th and 16th centuries, such Italian skill set or technique expressed its top fruits in the production of musical instruments around the botteghe of Amati and Stradi, and in the so-called Orologeria Minuta, uh, small clockwork. This might surprise you, but Italy was a leading center in clock making. Uh, so the gears that we saw with Leonardo earlier from the question you answer, uh, asked before. So the first mechanical clocks actually were invented in Italy and the bell tower of St. Eustorgius in Milan has one of the oldest ones uh, dating back uh, 1309. And during the Renaissance, the Italian botteghe led the European production of small size and jewelry watches. It is only with uh, the British Industrial Revolution and the organization of serial systems for the production of watches in Germany and Switzerland that the Italian network of clockmaking workshops lost its primacy. And until the 19th century, clockmaking was still considered in Italy a fine art. Now, if I were to pick an example of a contemporary bottega, which combines industrial and artistic manufacture, I would point to GDE Bertoni, and I dedicated, I, I will dedicate an episode on March 1st to Silvio Gazzaniga, who is the founder of GDE Bertoni. GDE Bertoni is the world's leading company in the production of sports trophies and medals. And the company started by Silvio Gazzaniga, which uh, was made famous by the design in 1971 of the FIFA World Cup, as you see. Lastly, technique is not just a relational tool, but also a social art, a collective form of doing together. Now, if we expand the size of the bottega, uh, we will get to the Italian idea of the fabbrica, which expressed a choral and individual model of shared participation in a long lasting project. Now the word fabbrica now exclusively means plant. But in the early modern age, so also the time of Leonardo, it actually expressed the life network of skills and ideals of a working community in the surroundings of a church. So la fabbrica di San Pietro, la fabbrica del Duo, la fabbrica del Rosario. Whatever project it might have been, especially those with a long-term breath, there was a fabbrica, which was kind of a working piazza where sculptors, artisans, architects, painters, stone cutters, wood carvers, but also investors, philosophers, and academics could interact on a common endeavor to outlast time. Certainly the religious aspect was an important element in these monumental collaborative works. If you think about the Duomo in Milano, like six centuries to complete. Uh, but also in a secular context, the fabrica expressed a common participation in a productive effort, a choral art of doing. As we can see later in, Italian, in the development of Italian industrialism from the late 19th century, in the case of two industrial cities of Crespidada and Ivrea. Now Crespidada uh, is a company town uh, that was created near Bergamo in the late 19th century in Lombardy by the textile entrepreneur Cristoforo Crespi for really the workers of his cotton plant. Now, the town, which was the first village in Italy endowed with modern electrical lighting and that is included in the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, is really an example of a virtuous fabrica where the lack of strikes over the course of Crespi's management around the 20th century, related to the workers' active participation in the shared life and common work of, of, the, of, the, of the fabrica. The second example is related to another idea, this in Northern Piedmont, you might have heard of it, uh, Ivrea, which is also part of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites and which was its development 
to the visual input of Adriano Olivetti. Now, Olivetti, uh, which started in 1808, was the first Italian producer of typewriters. Uh, and during the 20th century, it represented an avant-garde in technical research and design. So once again, the development of computers, but also the development of design. This will be, uh, the Gremio Olivetti is actually the model for Steve Jobs. And uh, Jobs keep recurring, and going back to the visionary combination of design and technology uh, that Adriano Olivetti uh, kind of constru constructed. Now, the first prototype of the, of the computer, the P101, was programmed in Ivrea in 1964. Uh, the so-called Perrottina from the name of Perotti, the designer, the engineer of this computer. And great designers like Marcello Poli, uh, who signed the Lettera 22 typewriter, or Sass, who designed the Valentin, the first typewriter, uh, um, portable typewriter, uh, which came out in 1968 as a symbol of the sexual revolution of the political revolution of 1968, because it was allowing for the first time writers to carry uh, the typewriter they wanted. And uh, Bellini also is another great uh, designer for Olivetti, he designed the DV Summa, one of the top calculators in 1972. But uh, the great design for the company most iconic design pieces of the 20th century. And most of them are actually at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York or in several museums around the world. The Olivetti case, however, is also exceptional due to the structure of work that Adriano Olivetti envisioned. By building a town for his workers, by hiring with uh, managers and technicians, also a large cohort of artists, writers, and architects, and by involving them in a collaborative, some say utopian project of community movement. So from these examples, we see the Fabrica as a coordinated process of technological and cultural interactions, where the manufacturing work is intrinsically related to the effort of giving shape to something meaningful, long-lasting, and choral. So the homo faber, so the fabricating man, embodies then the ideal of not just doing, but of doing with purpose and meaning. A last contemporary example is fusion of philosophy and entrepreneurship of aesthetics and production is the Umbrian fashion entrepreneur uh, Brunello Cucinelli, uh, and I invite you to really watch the episode that I dedicated on him or on Camillo and Adriano Olivetti on Italian on, on YouTube for more information about him. Uh, he's really a philosopher entrepreneur who uh, claims, uh, reclaims the, the role, the primacy of philosophy for um, running a successful business. Um, so he's like a Kashmir entrepreneur. Uh, and the service process proves uh, the validity of this um, humanistic approach to entrepreneurship. So to recapitulate, we talked about Italy's humanistic approach to technology or technique as design, storytelling, relationship, and social collaboration. Uh, what does this have to do with technology? as we mean in our contemporary sense, as we described at the beginning. Well, if we apply this model of technical construction from the physical reality to the virtual reality of the web, from the construction of gears to software design, from the fabrica to our global collaborative network of production, we can actually see that the cultural and technical metis of Leonardo and Italy's tradition can offer an interesting contribution to the North American philosophy of technology. And Olivetti, as I was saying, is one example of this in his uh, incredible influence that he had on Steve Jobs. And this Italian model, this Leonardesque model actually can provide an alternative model and perhaps an antidote against the risk of technocracy. And I really hope this chat opened kind of a new way of thinking about uh, the way we use our tools and uh, how, above all, we construct meaning uh, upon them. And before taking questions, I really wanted to thank you for uh, 
being here tonight and I invite you to um, go check out my uh, YouTube show, Italian Innovators, where you can find uh, some of the profiles of the uh, people I mentioned in the presentation. And you can subscribe to receive like notifications of uh, new episodes, like the one coming up on, uh, in February, there's one coming up on the industry of perfumes and uh, in March, one on um, GD Bertoni, uh, the company uh, that designed the World Cup. And if you're interested and uh, you want to check out the web page, uh, uh, you can find also information on my upcoming lectures. I'm doing a series of uh, lectures for the uh, Italian General Concert of Philadelphia uh, that deal with uh, the themes of the show. So the uh, next lecture will be on uh, February 10th. Uh, and it will be dedicated to bicycles. Um, and this is also another case of what we're saying uh, tonight, where uh, the innovation that uh, a, an Italian mechanic named Edoardo Bianchi introduced to bicycles. He was the first one who uh, designed bicycles with equal wheels of equal size. That, that technical innovation actually led to the uh, growth of the Italian mechanical industry and also the creation of the cycling market, which applied on the one hand, the construction of tourism, uh, so cycling tourism, and on the other hand, to the construction of sports uh, with the invention of the Giro d'Italia. So bicycle, a technical innovation that relates to uh, the creation of new forms of social life so and sports, but also that impact, affect kind of the uh, national, so uh, they are also political and cultural forms. So thanks again, and if there are any other questions, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, comment sure. or respond. Before I open the, the floor to everyone to ask the questions themselves, there are still a couple of questions left uh, from before, and one by Morgan's husband. A question, uh, so I hear a lot of the inventions we attri attribute to Leonardo da Vinci are not actually his. How do we academics authenticate what is and what is not his own works, inventions? Uh, there are a lot of inventions. And uh, since we were mentioning uh, bicycles, uh, this is one, uh, one of the cases that is more often quoted. Uh, it seems like Leonardo designed uh, drew a bicycle in the Atlantic Codex. Uh, the bicycle that was actually uh, drawn in the Codex uh, might have been like... Um, a later addition, uh, but one of the um, people who were handling the um, pages of the Atlantic Codex. So that is an erroneous attribution. It's obviously an erroneous attribution of an invention, which uh, was uh, introduced much later. Uh, the case, for example, of the aerial screw that I mentioned, um, the aerial screw uh, is not necessarily the helicopter. Uh, the aerial screw is basically the principle of a spring, which is tightened and uh, kind of released, um, but it's not like really the con of the helicopter. However, this analogical space that I was describing earlier is really the space where uh, things can be placed within a larger movement, within a larger motion, and eventually lead to um, the construction of related inventions not necessarily attributable to Leonardo himself, but that someone were stirred in motion by Leonardo's uh, reflection or what we said earlier, visual knowledge. Um, so in this sense, um, science is a... Um, let me talk... Like, literature is memory reinvented. It's based upon the memory of the book read that we reinvent to create new books. In a way, science is memory reinvented because like uh, what we receive from the elaboration of the past uh, is really the base for further elaboration. Uh, so in the sense, they, they run a parallel path. Um, Thank you, Luca. And Faria is asking, how can an artist be recognized as an engineer? I mean, look at Stradivarius violins, for instance. They are pieces of art, but Antonius did never calculate the structure forces from strings to the bridge and then to the body. It was all by experience and experiment. No engineering involved, right? 
Well, this is part, on the one hand, of the idea of knowing by doing. And uh, engineering is a knowing by doing. Uh, there is an abstract notion of engineering as a, a detached uh, knowledge, uh, whereas uh, engineering is always an applied knowledge and knowledge by doing. Uh, with regard to Stradivari, uh, what is interesting is that, like, um, if you think about his one of his greatest innovations is uh, the letter S that is in design in his violins, which is what guarantees uh, not just an aesthetic dimension to the violin, but also a uh, an opening for a kind of a deeper um, for the achievement of a deeper sound. Uh, the deeper quality of sound. So um, it might not have been calculated. I don't know if there are like any notes that he left, uh, but uh, that knowledge by allowed to achieve a result and an outcome that uh, is equally perfect, even more, also because it, it contains kind of this um, kind of in, in fashion, we we'll say this grief, this authorship, this recognizable uh, touch which is in, in literary, in literary uh, terms, we will call it style from the Latin stylus, pen, uh, pen which is the, the touch, the way in which someone holds the pen, uh, which makes an object no longer serial and anonymous, but unique. Thank you. And Christine is asking, do you have any idea when the artistic became separated from the scientific, when the definition of one is almost the exclusion of the other? Well, this uh, will be probably related to the word uh, scientia, um, scientia, <laughs> uh, which in Latin means knowledge. Uh, the, the, the division uh, is actually related to the moment in which science became associated with natural sciences or to that knowledge that we achieve through the application of the science method. So what we call the scientific revolution, 16th and uh, 17th century, is that point of where scientia, so as the knowledge as a whole, is um, separated into science, which is then knowledge of the natural world, and what Vico, uh, the philosopher Vico, would call the human sciences, uh, or what we mean with the word humanities, uh, as opposed to, which is kind of that other realm of, um, of knowledge that applies to the moral life, to aesthetics, and to all the things that are not necessarily quantifiable, but that are like a big part of our human experience. We have another question. There have been reports that Da Vinci was involved with a secret organization named the Priori of Sion. Is there any validity to these claims? I don't know. <laughs> then we move to the next one. How do you see Italy's future in terms of creativity, innovations and inventions? Well, this is really the point of, of my, uh, my work with Italian innovators. Um, I invite you to really check out the um, interviews that um, in, in, the, in the show, I do several kinds of episodes. Uh, ones are like profiles of like great innovators uh, where I try to trace the model uh, behind their uh, idea of innovation. Uh, there are also episodes that are interviews and of those interviews, I invite you to check out like uh, the conversations with uh, Italian contemporary uh, designers, entrepreneurs, also academics. Um, what I would recommend is the episode with um, the conversation I had with Mauro Porcini, who is the chief designer of Pepsi. Uh, and uh, the conversation is entitled, What is Italian Design? And uh, why does uh, an Italian designer uh, become the... Uh, first chief designer of Pepsi. Pepsi is one of the leading companies uh, in this sense that understands the um, act of design thinking uh, on production and, uh, and productivity. And uh, it's the first company that actually opened the position for a, a chief designer. Uh, and so the conversation with him might uh, offer you some insights on really the contributions that Italians are 
uh, continuing to make in, in, in our contemporary world. And also the interview with, uh, with Fiorenzo Menetto that I mentioned earlier on, on Silk. So we move to the next question. Uh, thank you, Luca, for this wonderful talk. I want to explore some political dimensions of this subject. You suggest there is a connection from gears to the web and from fabrica to globalization, but our present models and systems seem to dismiss the value of collective work. How can we reinvigorate Leonardo's models and ideas to this present day problem? That's a very, very important question. And uh, thank you for, uh, I'm glad you liked the, the presentation. Um, my humble question to this is really the opening up of an alternative space uh, of, um, of, of an alternative model where this uh, virtuous collaboration uh, takes place. And I was doing this in, both in the religious and in the secular context. Um, in the religious context, uh, the of the cathedral is very evocative and powerful. So when there is a colored ideal, uh, then collaboration becomes um, more um, viable. In the same way, uh, the experience of uh, Crespi Dada and uh, Olivetti are often addressed as utopian but really uh, they're not because they 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 were uh, actual experiences that took place for many decades and those experiences um like the experience of brunello cuccinelli with uh, with this industry of, of cashmere uh highlight the existence of an alternative and in this sense um the existence of this alternative opens up uh a different horizon to the sense of um, the kind of inevitability of our of our present condition, where well, it's inevitable that we're all uh, kind of divided. We're all um, working on on different planes, and we're all kind of working on on exploiting each other. Um, but um, it's not inevitable. This this is the fruit of a, of a choice of a certain. Um, politics of, uh, of technology, uh, what I mentioned earlier as technocracy, which presents itself as neutral, but is not neutral at all. Uh, and there's always a human being behind uh, technology. And there are several uh, reflections on this. You might have seen like the social dilemma as one of the documentaries where, which challenges this assumption, for example, in the realm of social media. But like um, there is a lot of uh, debate, for example, on robotics, on artificial intelligence and on the limits and the use that, that we can uh, do of it. Um, I'm certainly not uh, against artificial intelligence. The problem is that even artificial intelligence needs to have a cultural element because uh, if you're familiar with uh, digital marketing, uh, the analysis that are conducted through artificial intelligence respond to uh, a data input that is placed at the beginning. And if the data input is biased at the beginning, then the outcomes of what artificial intelligence produce uh, as well. So uh, in this sense, there, there, there needs to be like this uh, necessary relationship between culture and, and technology and not like this artificial separation, uh, debasing the humanities and um, placing in technology kind of all the hopes to remedy for, for our situations, for our current situation. Again, not, I'm not here to solve the problem. I, I think this, um, this model pointing to these uh, virtuous models can uh, introduce the possibility of an alternative uh, and break the, the cycle of in inevitability. Um, the following question by Morgan. Um, in the Divine Comedy, Dante writes about the restrictive nature of contenting oneself with ingenio only. That to truly thrive, one benefits from pairing it with intelletto. Is this idea something that was carried forward to Leonardo's lifetime, or did it exist even before Dante wrote about it? This uh, combination between ingenio and intellecto, and intellecto, perhaps for those of you of, of us who don't know what 
is this difference? Perhaps you can explain it a little bit better. Thank you for the question. And certainly this goes back to the uh, classical heritage um, where uh, ingenium, as we described earlier, is this kind of operative mindset um, combining um, kind of the finding of solution with uh, myth-making storytelling. And uh, intellectus, intellect, uh, comes from interlegere, which means to read through. So the work of a, an intellectual is really to read through, to connect dots. Uh, this is intrinsically related to the work of an ear in the same way as music is related to the work of a physicist, uh, as in the example of Fabiola Gianotti that I was discussing in one of the episodes. Um, now, um, what is the role of an intellectual in today's world? What does an intellectual do? Uh, again, I go back to the example of the starry sky. And um, if you think about the internet, the internet is kind of a similar starry sky um, where we have a lot of information on display, but where it is very difficult to figure out what is closer and what is farther, what is superficial and what is deep. And so often when they go on the internet, they find all information equal to itself. So uh, they are not necessarily able to feel is relevant, really relevant, and what is just accessory. Uh, so in this sense, an intellectual is, uh, I'm sure, had this experience when you go in front of a starry sky and you find someone who knows a little bit about it, uh, and the person starts to connect the stars in constellations or, st or tells you, look, if you observe that dot, it's a little bit red, it's actually Mars, so it's a planet, not a star, or if you observe the light, you can figure out that dot is actually way farther than and this one is, is, is closed. So this gives the ability to um, find relevance in this wall of information or what we would call with regard to the internet, big data. Uh, so with big data, we know is able to read through in the same way. And uh, so ingenium is related to intellect in the, in, in, in the sense that this ability to read through is also an ability to predict and also to um, design solutions or to imagine uh, future kind of developments. So uh, it goes back to the classical tradition, but uh, once again, before it was mentioned at kind of Thomas Aquinas University, uh, this is really an interesting model to pursue, which is very lively in Italy, uh, a little bit less here because like um, of dominance of the tech approach to technology. Uh, I have another question for you. Uh, as an Italian innovator, do you believe that North American schools can make transitions to encompassing art and science with a culture and language which does not link the two? It is clear that the Italian language has profound impacts upon thought processes of art and science. English makes a divide between the two. Well, what I can say is that like um, learning another language, and I'm doing a little bit of promotion for your Italian courses, uh, at the Dante Ligieri and the Dante Society, another language gives you the possibility um, to really expand your horizon, but above all to learn what you think you know, uh, to learn from a different perspective. So in the encounter with a radical you or a radical difference, um, way you name things or you, the name you conceive things, uh, one is forced to ask the question to oneself about what makes me me. So uh, this is really bumping into a you, you're forced to ask, who are you, what makes you, you different, but also what makes me, me. And this is really at the origin of a discovery of your own culture, sometimes uh, of your own language as well. Uh, many students actually learn English grammar by uh, studying Italian. So they, 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 they start to possess the, ling the English grammar in a different way, in a more uh, conscious uh, way. So 
this is certainly the value of, of learning a language. I, I wouldn't attribute like a, a primacy of thought to Italian culture rather than the, the English language. You know, uh, out of my experience here in the US, I found um, a lack of um, kind of the English language uh, inability to define things of the English language that um, is is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, whereas uh, Italian sometimes can be uh, terribly baroque or obscure. Uh, it might it might get to be a very poetic and deep language on the one hand, but also very obscure language, whereas English, which might appear simplistic at uh, kind of at the first glance, a very um, precise language. It's not a chance that it's the language that's very definitory language. Thank you, Luca. And are there any other questions? Yes, here it is. Thank you, Flavio. Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. Uh, are there questions? People who would like to j jump in <laughs> or join? If Hi. Are... Actually, yes, here oh, is. So sorry. Um, hi, actually, if I could jump in and just have a few questions. Um, I'm actually a student of Dr. Dagnia's and I was wondering um, if we were to watch your YouTube show, what kind of takeaways can we as students maybe aspiring to be somewhere in this field could um, get? Because you were talking about rationality and um, the reasonableness in connection with the art. So how to intelligence. So how are these expressed in your work? Well, there are several. Thank you for the question, first of all, and I'm glad that you are interested in, in the work. But um, in in, um, in the show that you find on YouTube, there are several like rubrics and there are several categories of episodes that tap into different um, goals or things that you might take away from it. So uh, in, in the innovators category, I just point to examples of uh, this approach to innovation that deliberately combines arts and um, technology. Um, so along the lines of what we're seeing uh, tonight. Uh, the interviews give like a more kind of dialogic sense of what is contemporary, what is Italy's relationship to contribution to the contemporary world. Uh, and this is kind of like on several fields. Uh, then there are like, uh, my lectures, which is, which are part kind of my intellectual uh, development, and it's kind of if you're interested in kind of uh, continuing with uh, the reflection that I started on uh, the origins of Italian industrial culture and design, um, that is the object of my book, uh, The Art of Objects. If you're interested in design, that might be an interesting uh, takeaway. Uh, and also there are like lessons, which is called Italian Ages. Um, on the Italian cultural history. So uh, you can go from the uh, 13th century, now we got uh, the 19th century, I publish one every month, uh, and uh, get a sense of like Italian cultural history seen from the perspective of cultural literature, but from the perspective of cultural literature and entrepreneurship, uh, which is something that is often not included, also because the humanities as well tend to seclude themselves or to cut themselves off from uh, kind of the industry or the development of technology. And uh, there are also lessons which are called uh, Italian modernities, where I really give a sense of the development of the history of fashion, the history of design. Uh, the last one was, I published one, the last one was on the history of keeping. So how uh, Italy was fundamental, uh, for example, creation of World Standard Time. Uh, World Standard Time was um, created at the DC Meridians of 1884, uh, which was a political conference uh, which ratified the uh, origin of time in Greenwich. But like uh, the real conference took place actually in Rome in 1883. And it was the scientific conference where all the scientists of the world debated on uh, how to do it and uh, what origins we would give to, to our time. So, and it's quite paradoxical because like uh, we are natives of this, but um, 
to say that the origin of time is London is actually quite funny. <laughs> so uh, we, we no longer perceive it, um, or to say that the origins of time is actually an algorithm, mathematical algorithm that allows to have 24 hour days on all the spots of the earth, which is kind of like a, a flat, um, like a spheroid flatten at the poles. It's not like a perfect, perfect sphere where all on all the spots, the, the hours of the day are the same. So the Italian culture reacts to these uh, changes in a very different way than the North American culture. So in North American culture, new innovations are uh, immediately thrown into the market and used. Uh, in Italian culture, given the heritage, the classical heritage, the Christian heritage that is uh, the, the, the kind of the soil where these innovation arrive, um, they are bombarded with questions they arrive. <laughs> and so literature and culture starts to ask questions. So what is the meaning of this new notion of time? What does it change if time is no longer on a tower bell and we have it instead on our what on, on our wrists, like wristwatches? What what do we mean that we own time now? So um this is to say that um, what I'm trying to do is to observe Italian culture from the perspective of um kind of American, um, North American culture as a way to learn more about Italian culture, but also as a way to read North American culture from a different perspective and perhaps open up a, a different way of looking at it. Then as a student, it, I don't know what you study, but like uh, I deal with uh, design, fashion, uh, technology, uh, well, a lot of literature, um, business, Depends on what you do. Like, uh, if you go on the on the web, they categorize all the episodes depending on the topic of interest. So um, that might be something to to check out. Thank you. Thank you so much to look forward to. <laughs> And also, like this, this is for engineering students. This is our engineers. Uh, this is an encouragement to really use uh, your humanity as a resource, not as um, kind of obliterate, um, to not stop being human. In a way, the creativity of Leonardo stirs in us the desire to be more human. And this is not quantifiable, it's not useful, but it's actually the most useful thing. Uh, that's why, I'm sorry, I was trying to speak, but I was unmuted. <laughs> yes, yes, so sorry. thank you. I think this is a, the, a beautiful way of closing this uh, conversation with you. I mean, just uh, encouraging engineers to be more you, human or to use their, their humanness, your, their humanity when building their machines and, uh, and their technologies. And so thank you, Professor Cotini, who has been with us from Pencil, so, sorry, from Philadelphia. So he, it's late in the night for him. And so it's time for, <laughs> for him <laughs> to go to bed. And, <laughs> and so thank you for all of you who were with us tonight. Um, and uh, we'll see you again on this screen together on Zoom uh, for our next event on February the 4th uh, with a talk uh, on uh, by a couple uh, of Canadians who decided to buy their home, their dream home in Tuscany. Thank you to uh, everyone and see you next. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie mille, Ariana. Grazie. Grazie, professor. Grazie mille, arrivederci. Grazie, grazie. Arrivederci, Laura, e grazie. Arrivederci. 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 Bye bye.
è stato un bellissimo incontro, sì. Luca. Bye Sto bye. leggendo. Ah, tutti i commenti. Te li posso mandare, fra l'altro. Ah, qui sono, sono tantissimi. Se riesci a mandarmeli, li, li, li guardo sì, poi dopo. Li mando tutti, sì, sì. Bene, no, bene, sono contento che sia piaciuto e sì. ho tante domande. Sì, sì, è piaciuto molto a tutti con dei bellissimi commenti che ti manderò eh, su uh, Humanize My te Technology is My Motto. <ride> eh, no, <sì>. bene. <ride> <ride> bene, bene. No, 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 è che non sono riuscito a leggere, adesso stavo pensando a rispondere, ma non stavo leggendo cosa, cosa ho scritto, però insomma tutti molto molti. Per cui... sì, sono tutti molto bellissimi messaggi di, proprio tutti di ringraziamento e di proprio eh, hanno tutti apprezzato molto in, very inspiring eh, quindi credo che eh, che sia andata molto bene, bene. Noi, noi poi ci risentiamo dobbiamo fare una cosa a marzo eh sì, dobbiamo Adesso vedere non mi ricordo, però, quando, sì, sì, eh, eh, devo capire un attimo i tempi. Ci risentiamo, sì, 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 no, ci risentiamo a qualche punto. C'era Milola che appunto chiedeva di, di poter fare il 18 marzo, devo capire un attimo allora come funzionava se ehm, in caso, se, tu aprile sarebbe troppo, cioè, avresti dei problemi se fosse aprile? Aprile è meglio, è meglio di marzo, aprile ah. è meglio di marzo, marzo è pienissimo per me. Sì, benissimo. E... Cioè, come date, forse aprile è più viable. Sì. Volevo vedere se Laura è rimasta ancora, volevo presentartela, ma no, oh no è andata via, Laura Nelson. Oh no, è andata... Era un'altra board member della Dante. Ehm, sì, se fosse aprile, allora benissimo, per noi allora ancora meglio, anche così sì, sì, sì. Vai, dimmi tu. Ti, ti faccio poi sapere bene con le, con le date. Nel frattempo ti, poi ti chiederò se mi potessi fare la fattura per questo, se per questo invece per questo evento. Eh, me la puoi mandare? Cioè cosa devo, cosa devo ah, fare? Niente, una fattura. Cioè, semplicemente... no, spiegami... Te, te cioè, ne devo... mando una pro forma, così. Sì, se mi dà una... Sì. <ride> va bene, va bene. Mandami tu le cose che, che devo fare. <ride> e... E partiamo da lì. Va bene? Sì. Dai. Buona serata. Grazie. Allora, grazie a... Ciao, ciao, grazie a te. Ciao. Ciao. Bye bye to everyone.